Hallelujah. Yeah, as I'm getting this up, we did have a, a great, I thought it was great Sunday school this morning. And um, just so elated how many kids we had. We had uh, quite a few. Okay. All right. And I wanted to share that one song by Ron Canoli about the glory of the Lord, because it's what we will be talking about today, the glory of the Lord. So, you know, and the, and the reason for that is uh, sometimes in our hustle and bustle lives, going here, going there, just so busy, 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 going to work, doing uh, hobbies and crafts and fixing up the house and doing things, all kind of things. We need to just stop. Amen. We need to just stop and take in all of God that we can. We need to just stop and think about him and think about the glory of the Lord and the praise of the Lord and, and everything that uh, emanates from him. So today I want us to recognize the glory of the Lord and I want us to be enveloped in the glory of the Lord. He is God and there is no other. The Bible tells us he is God all by himself and there is no one like him. So let's talk a bit about the glory of the Lord and put our focus on him this morning. Now the Hebrew word for glory is kabod, K-A-B-O-D. And it means to be heavy and it means to be weighty like a heaviness, a weightiness, amen? A heaviness and a weightiness. And it brought to mind uh, Psalm 24, beginning at verse seven. His glory refers to his weightiness, his honor and his greatness. So Psalm 24, beginning with verse seven, it says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory, the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? It's the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? It's the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Shelah. Think about that. That's what the word Selah means. You're supposed to pause and think about what you just read. And Lord God, we're thinking about your glory this morning. We're thinking about who you are. We're thinking about what you mean to us, Lord God. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord God. So glory is always summarized as his um his, his greatness or his great radiance. You know, when you see pictures of God, when artists try their best to give us what they believe the glory of God is like, you see maybe a halo or the room is lit uh, with the uh, bright sunshine or, you know, and that's the artist's rendition of what they feel. Sometimes I wonder if we have uh, that same excitement. Uh, when we think about God, what do you think about? How does he radiate, radiate his glory to you? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you feel? So his, his glory is sort of summarized in that radiance, the, the gravity of, of which is immeasurable. We can't even begin. So the best that we can do is is give our thoughts on God and his glory because he is um, undescribable. He is God everlasting. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. That should be our prayer for our family. Lord God, just walk through your house every day. Lord, let your glory rise among my family members today. 
in this house, every room, go through every room, anoint every room, Lord God, every place that my family's feet tread on in this house, Lord God, let your glory be there, Lord God, and fill us to overflowing. Amen. So when we speak of God, to, to speak of God is to speak of uh, infinite beauty and, and greatness in the highest splendor in the universe. Amen. The glory of God is the visible manifestation of his character. His character. Everything about him is glorious, magnificent, immeasurable. Now, the Hebrew name for God is in the Bible, and it's Yahweh. Yahweh, I know you've heard and seen and used that word yourself when you talk about God. And what that means is he brings into existence whatever exists. And he told Moses at one point, I am who I am. I am who I am. He had given Moses instructions to go back to the people. And Moses said, who am I to tell them who sent me? And he said, just tell them I am sent you. In other words, he was saying, whatever you need me to be, I am. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do. You're my children. And I hold nothing good from you. So that name, that Yahweh, the name came uh, to be regarded as too sacred for the Hebrew people to even be spoken. And when they would write it, they would take out the 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 uh, the vowels, and they would spell Yahweh Y H W H, because they thought that the name was even too holy for them to speak in its fullness or to write down. So the name Jehovah is the same name based on a, the Latin equivalents. Amen. So in the Latin, it's in the Hebrew is Yahweh. In the Latin is Jehovah. So since God is spirit, according to uh, John 4.24, human eyes cannot see him. They can't behold him directly, right? Sinners would be consumed by God's holiness and, and they would suffer instant death due to their sin if they would behold God's majesty. In Exodus uh, 33, 30, God said to Moses, he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Remember Moses had to, uh, God had to turn his back and all Moses saw was the backside of God. You cannot look at God and live, amen. So in order for God to reveal himself to us, he must communicate his manifold perfections to us, his creatures, through his visible glory. Now, what is his glory? How does he do that? Well, when we look at nature, when we look at the universe, when we look at the stars and the moon and the, and the sun and everything that God put in this universe for us to enjoy, he is saying, this is my glory. And I give it to you. I give it to you. When I have the sun to rise every morning, remember me. This is part of my glory that I give to you. This is part of my glory. So God's glory is the outshining of the infinite values of all that he is. And all of the things that he gives us. So in our future heavenly city that uh, Revelation talks about, in that city, in the new heaven, in a new earth, there is no need for the sun or the moon, remember? Because the glory, the glory of God has illuminated it. And its lamp is the Lord. That's in Revelation 21. 
So the sun and the moon and the things that we have here on planet earth is for humanity now. But when we are in that heavenly city, the glory of God radiates so much, there won't even be a need for the sun and the moon because his glory is so bright and so perfect. That's all we would need. Amen. The prominence and the, and the radiance of God's glory go hand, hand in hand. When God appears, the pure and the perfect character of God is manifested in the blinding white light of his radiance. All we can do is try to have our mind's eye to see what we think it's like based on what we know about earth. We don't know about heavenly things. So when we talk about the glory of, of God, we talk about maybe the brightest light that we've ever seen or, or uh, you know, a, the fireplace brightness on a, when you light the fireplace in the winter time and the light is so bright. So we have to use earthly things to help us to understand heavenly things and especially God. Amen. We have to do that. He says, I am who I am. He's a lot of things all rolled into one. The glory of the Lord is infinite. And it's great. And it's unsearchable. There is no one and there's nothing like it in the entire universe. No one compares to God, to our God. It is a foolish person that will not give their life to the creator of this world and the one who holds every breath that they take in his hand. It's a foolish person who would turn from the living God and turn to the gods of this world is their hope. There is no hope in them. It's a foolish person that would jeopardize their salvation with the false gods and idols of this world. I am who I am. Mere words to describe his greatness <laughs> are very sadly inadequate. We try, but they're inadequate. So how does one describe the, the, the grandeur and, and, and the majesty of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-glorious, infinite being like God? He is beyond our comprehension and our ability to convey his greatness in words. Even the most perfect words of scripture are a limited expression of his glory. All we can say in response to the glory of God is, who is like unto them, to the old Lord among the gods? There's no one or nothing. So like Job, in the book of Job, in, in chapter 40, uh, he, uh, we put our hands to our mouth and we cry, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you, O oh God? Job had a realization you know. at a point in his life. He had a realization and then he came to his senses, okay? After going back and forth with God, he found out that God had the answers and he didn't. And all he could do was put his hand to his mouth and, and say, behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? What can I say to a God who knows everything? And even the words that I try to use to express what I feel about you, God, you put them into my mouth. Matter of fact, you put every breath that I take into my lungs. You are my breath. 
You're my breathing. You're every step I take. Amen. So the right response to the glory of God is loving and humble worship. That's why I love praise music. And that's why I love worship music. Because it helps to get to a place in my mind to get as close as I can to almighty God to express what I'm feeling in my heart, which is inadequate, but he receives it. So I use that in praise. When I praise God, the more we understand and appreciate about who God is, the more we will love him and adore him and want to praise him. The more you will turn away from all of that other secular music, and I, I'm pretty sure everybody on this Zoom has done that. But we need to get away from that. That's filling our heads and our hearts with things that are totally opposed to God. Totally opposed to God. I have a scripture I want to share. Let me get it up here. First Chronicles on your screen. First Chronicles 16, 28 and 29 says, give to the Lord, O families of the people, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory that's due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the beauty of holiness. Psalm 29, two, two versions. The first one is New King James. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And the ESV, ascribe, it uses the word ascribe to the Lord, the glory that's due his name and worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. There is a splendor, there is a beauty of holiness that we invoke into our presentation of our love to him. We ascribe to the glory of God through the splendor and the beauty of holiness. Amen. What is it scribe? It's an attribute, it, uh, uh, attribute of something. Regard a quality of belonging to. Mm -hmm. to assign, to credit, to give, or to count. And, and so to ascribe or to give to the Lord, the glory to his name means to see, to understand, to acknowledge the glory that God already has. Amen. We're saying, God, we see it. God, just give us much of that glory in our presence as possible. And we give it back to you in our praise. And that's the way that works. And what does the beauty of holiness mean? The beauty of holiness? The Hebrew text is actually better translated as a, a adornment. So in ancient times, the priest were instructed to wear a particular set of garments for their work in the temple. They didn't wear their uh, regular priestly outfits. They had to wear special clothing to go into the Holy of Holies, to go into the temple. Now those garments were set apart. They were holy by their craftsmen for this purpose. They put a lot of detail. They prayed over them. They gave them to the Lord. They anointed these things. 
And so when the priest would put them on and go into the Holy of Holies, what the priest was actually saying is, God, I'm giving you my best when I come before you to praise you, to talk to you. I'm not bringing the street in with me. I'm bringing glory. I'm bringing lovely things. I'm putting on this special clothing. And I'm, I'm hoping that you see that I'm trying to do my best, Lord God, to show you that I love you so much that I give you my best. I'm giving you my best. The priests were, they were required to wash their bodies before and after wearing these special clothing. They took their time before God very, very seriously. So the key here is, is not the garments themselves, we know that, but what they represent. So everything that we do, Sharina did a lovely presentation this morning about modesty, which is holiness. And that's for men and women. It used to be just the women. Now it's the men and the women. And when we put on our best and when we dressed our best, we're, we're, we're telling God, God, I'm doing this not just for me, but I'm doing this for you because I know it pleases you. I know it pleases you. Now, I want to share a couple of things. We are called to worship him in the beauty of holiness. We're called to worship him in the beauty of holiness. So again, this is not just lip service or empty praise. We are called to put that love into action in our daily lives. We are to continually praise him and to tell him about his salvation. We are to proclaim his righteous judgments. Everybody, not just our fellow believers, it's like what they call preaching to the choir. So after all, a life of devotion is the only acceptable sacrifice for everything that he's done for us. That's all. Not that he's asking us to pay him back because there's nothing on this earth <laughs> that would satisfy the amount of blessings that he has given us. All he wants is worship. All he wants is praise. So we're called to worship him in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is making, preparing ourselves to face God. We are called to walk in the benefits of his holiness. What's that? And we are not uh, 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 supposed to just sing all day long, but we are to worship the heavens and the earth and the sea and the sky and the trees and all of the living things proclaim the goodness of the Lord, Lord, and they shout for joy, according to Psalms 96. It says the trees clap their hands. Nature recognizes God, but unfortunately, all too often, the people made in his image don't. Nature loves to worship God. So when, and when Jesus himself was rebuked by the Pharisees for uh, adulation he was receiving, he answered that if the people were silent, the rocks would cry out, right? He says, let them praise. God inhabits the praises of his people. He says, if we don't do it, the rocks will cry out. Ain't nobody, ain't no rock gonna take my place in worshiping God. Amen. The apostle Paul said later, uh, um, he recognized that the world, and, uh, the world uh, that we live in and that God created and that we're living in and we're breathing in, 
should actively give our testimonies wherever we go. Romans chapter one. And then he would argue that the whole universe is waiting for God's ultimate redemption and restoration from its fallen state and that we as Christians have the same longing within ourselves for God's perfect holy presence. For God's perfect holy presence. I want to conclude with this. This world is a mere shadow of the brightness and the glory of heaven. And we can only experience God in a partial and imperfect way as long as we're here, but we will gaze upon his splendor one day in truth when we stand before him renewed. For now, uh, Psalms, uh, you know, like, Psalms 96, it helps us to have a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like and what glory is going to be like. And it tells us to put on a garment of praise. That means to, to dress our whole selves, not what they, well, with a physical garment as well, but that means an attitude. When you put on a garment of praise, that means an attitude of praise. You can't praise God and look at television at the same time. Amen. The Hebrew people would, they would stand in awe, you know, of the glory of God. And we should too. To them, God was known by what he was to them in their life. So what I want to do, got a few minutes, I want to show you some names that we used this morning in Sunday school with the kids. And you can use these names when, uh, there's some up on the screen too, but uh, you can use these names when you worship God and love on God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The be that means the beginning of and the end. The chapter for that, where you find that name for God, is John chapter one. Christos, this is actually a name for Jesus. The first one was to Alpha and Omega. Um, first John four two. This means the Anointed One. The Anointed One. El Roy, El Roy. El, of course, is a general name, a generic name for God. All religions use El, but you, you're saying El, and then you're using the uh, second word to describe God sees. Roy means sees, so God sees. Scripture for that is, is Genesis 16, 13. Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Rapha, that means the Lord is our healer. How many needs a healing today? Call on Jehovah Rapha. Read Exodus 15. Call on Jehovah Rapha. That's what the Hebrew people did. God was known by what he did in their lives. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. The Lord over everything and everybody. 1 Samuel 17, 45. Jehovah Shabbat. Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. The word Shalom means a lot of things or more things in, in the Hebrew language. It means good morning, good afternoon, hello, goodbye. How are you? Have a good day. That word covers a lot. And it also means peace. So um, when you see two Jewish people, Hebrew people uh, walking by each other, shalom. Shalom. Have a good day. Shalom. And uh, they're wishing them, each other a good day. 
or good evening or goodbye. Shalom. Judges 6, 23, 24. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is our banner. Exodus, he covers us. Exodus 17, 8 through 15. Jehovah Tishkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. That's found in Hebrews 12, 14. Jehovah Tishkenu. Atilia Yolim, um, the ancient of days, referring to the Lord was here before anything was, and he will always be here. He was there, he has no beginning and no end. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. And so the Hebrew people would call him the ancient, the old one of many days, the ancient of days. Elohim means the creator. We know God to be the creator of the universe. And not only the creator, but he's the sustainer. I told the kids this morning, he keeps the moon in its place, the sun, the stars. You know, if he didn't, we might find a star in the backyard, but he holds all of the stars, billions of stars in their place. Genesis one, here is Jehovah Jireh. I think everybody knows that because there's so many songs with Jehovah Jireh, that means my provider, the Lord, our provider, that's in Genesis 22. Abba, Abba, that's the equivalent to, in our language, daddy. So I've got father up there, but it's really like daddy. When we address uh, God, you know, when we talk to him, talk to him like you would your dad. And most people don't use that proper uh you know, phrase, oh, father, would you do this? Father, can I have a, you know, a soda? Father, no, you say, dad, hey, dad, daddy. So it's like the equivalent, and that's closeness. That's that closeness. And that's in uh, Galatians 4, 6. And I think there's one more. No, that was it. That was it. So that was the last one. So those are all <clears throat> different names. And there's more, there's more. And there's more. So I picked out those, I think, 10 or 11. And we should get to know God by digging into these words and digging into the Bible, but more than anything else, just enveloping yourself in his glory with praise and worship. Confessing your sins. and turning away from anything that displeases him. We can't live in two camps. Either we are born again Christians living for God, or we're still in the world, there is no in between. So if you got one foot in the world and one foot, you know, in a uh, church or, you know, in your uh, salvation, it, you're really not saved. We just have to call it like it is. Praise God. So, hallelujah. Um, are there any questions? Those. Okay. Well, I'm, praise the Lord. I'm going to turn it over to the deaconess. Stop recording. Oh, okay. And because uh, we we have communion today, Sister Joy, Sister. Yes, Lisa. yes, I'm on here. God bless, God bless everyone, and we're getting ready to take communion. Now we ask if you knowingly are sinning and uh, committing sins that you not take communion. 